Irish uh, actor. Gentlemen, I'm so seeing uh, Chris okay. uh, we Matthews. We are we're officially live. Yes, and sir. What, before you start telling them you look like Chris Matthews <laughs> or Bill O'Reilly, let's first let the world know who's on here yes, today. Yes, let's do that. Former 15-year KGB member, I think 1973 to 1988. Uh, is here with us, Jack Barsky. Jack and I had a, a Zoom interview a couple yeah. months ago, which was very entertaining, to say the least. I think Lively. we had a good time together. Lively. Uh, uh, and uh, I hear the background. Whoever's got it on, someone's got it on. Jack, grab the mic. No, but somebody has the audio on that's playing. Is that you? No, just Okay, it was him. No, Tyler had it on. Just put the mic in front of you. Yeah. So, uh, but it's uh, good to have you on. Uh, we talked last time about uh, Yuri Beznamov. Uh, 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 Besmanov, we talked about the fact that he talked about the four stages, demoralization, destabilization, stage three is crisis, normalization, some of that stuff's going on today. Maybe you and I can go into that a little bit more. Active I think measures, some, I active believe measures. is what it was yeah, called. Yeah, absolutely, we'll, we'll get into that. And then obviously with everything that's going on with Russia, Ukraine today. But before we get started, uh, 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 Jack... If you don't mind, for the audience that doesn't know your background, even if you just take a couple minutes for the shorter version so we can get right into the story, I think it would be a good idea for some of the audience to hear about your background. Yeah, the, the short cliff notes yeah. uh, of, of a rather lengthy biography. <clears throat> Born in 1949 in, in the part of Germany that was occupied after World War II uh, uh, <clears throat> by, the, by the Soviet Army. Uh, grew up in the German Democratic Republic. That wasn't really democratic, it was communist. Uh, lived uh, in East Germany for uh, 26 years. Um, graduated with a master's degree in chemistry. And then I, the long detour began. The KGB recruited me. Um, I was trained to be an agent. I was initially was supposed to be an agent in West Germany. But it turned out that uh, I displayed a phenomenal talent for language. And I studied English, and I did it well enough that they decided to train me to become an American. <clears throat> Moved me to Moscow for two years, uh, where I had interaction with born Americans, studied uh, a lot of uh, uh, English, and uh, also got the best training that is available, was available by the KGB with regard to tradecraft, you know, how, how you operate as an agent. And in 1979, I appeared in New York City and uh, became Jack Barsky. So we, I took on the identity of a born American who had passed away at the age of 11, I believe. He had passed away at the he, age of eleven. Yes, the, he, the real Jack. The Barsky. real Jack Barsky, right. and and this was a, this was a, the typical way uh, the KGB stole IDs. In those days, it was possible you could get a birth certificate uh, from anybody. You didn't even have to show that you had a need or or were uh, uh, were justified in asking for a birth certificate. You just got it. <clears throat> what what a story right there. And by the way, I saw uh, you, I think it was on March 1st on Fox News on an interview. You talked about the fact that Russian spies may be added today, so we'll, uh, there may be some Russian spies amongst us. We'll talk about that. Uh, obviously, I want to uh, get some of your thoughts with the history of uh, what's going on between the two. But uh, just, just out of curiosity, did you have a chance to watch the documentary uh, Ukraine on Fire by Oliver Stone as well as Winter on Fire by the one that Sean, uh, Sean Penn, Penn was talking about? Have you seen those two documents? No, I have not. You haven't seen them? Okay. So just an open-ended question. What are your thoughts about what's really going on today between Ukraine and Russia? What's led up to this? What led up to this was uh, the formation of Vladimir Putin. The, 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 uh, Vladimir Putin was a KGB agent in East Germany <clears throat> in the town of Dresden. He was not much of an agent. He was a mid-level bureaucrat. But, you know, when in those days, when, when you joined as a Soviet citizen, you joined the KGB, you were a, a flaming communist and a patriot. Okay, so, and the KGB was, was I mean, it was the elite of the elite, right? Uh, he, so he, he was a mid-level bureaucrat in Dresden, uh, had the good life because East Germany uh, standard of, of living was much higher than... In, in, in the Soviet Union, uh, he, he, there's pictures of him. He, he was pretty chubby. He liked the German beer. And you can't so, blame him. The German beer is pretty good. I mean, yes, there, there's no bad beer in yeah. Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, 
And then there was a, a moment that uh, pretty much uh, shaped him ideologically. Um, there was when, uh, in 1989, when the wall came down, East German citizens w went, stormed a bunch of uh, uh, um, Stasi <clears throat> um, offices and in Dresden they went after the, the KGB office. Uh, and uh, the KGB, the guards wouldn't let them in and they told them, go away or else we're going to shoot. So they went away, they came back the next day. Vladimir called Berlin and asked Berlin, do we have permission to shoot if, if they come back? And Berlin said, we called Moscow, they're silent. That was the moment when Vladimir understood that uh, Gorbachev was letting go of East Germany. And this, uh, you know, and the idea that, you know, he belonged to the most powerful organization on the planet and he was, he was fundamentally, um, has, had no powers to do something. That was the beginning of Vladimir Putin, who he is today, because he sort of inside says, we got to, we, we got to, we got to fix this. Meaning we can't let this happen because it was seven decades of control, yes. essentially. Yes. Okay. But we got to fix this. We, uh, we, we are losing the greatness that we were. And, you know, and then not much later, the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, and this is what Vladimir's uh, goal was and still is, is, is reestablishing the, the Russian Empire. And so he's still a patriot, mind you. I think he's not a communist anymore. Maybe there's some residual mm -hmm. communist thinking, but he's a patriot, and he is, I believe, a huge narcissist because, uh, you know, you put that together, he, he, he thinks he is the only one who can do what he's trying to do to, uh, you know, establish uh, the greatness of, of Russia and build himself a monument right next to Peter the Great. And, and that is the driving force behind what's going on in Ukraine right now. That's the driving force behind what's going on in Ukraine right now. Okay. Uh, do you think the worst is here, or do you think it's going to get uglier? Uh, I'm afraid it could get uglier. We, we, there's a very fine line that the, that the West um, must walk, because he, there's speculation that Putin is not enti entirely sane. Well, there's insanity and there's insanity. What he's doing, actually, by invading Ukraine is insane by itself. You know, if... In, if a sane person does not go after uh, women and children, but there's a, if it goes beyond that, when he's you know, going crazy, he's got nukes. So we got to be really, really careful. You know, we can't let him get away with this. Uh, but uh, you know, hopefully, you know, some talks will happen, and hopefully, he finds an off ramp, because if he stays in Ukraine, he's done. He will not survive this in terms of, you know, long term. The Ukrainians will not allow him to occupy the country without major damage. Uh, the, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union started with uh, the debacle in Afghanistan, right? And this is going, if, if he occupies all of Ukraine, you're going to have an Afghanistan uh, multiplied several times over. Do you, do you think he... He watched how things were handled in Afghanistan, and the Taliban got, what, $80 billion or whatever the equipment was, and the mishandling of it that was uh, brought up by, both by on the folks on the left and the right, so it wasn't like a political side that they're just disagreeing. Do you think he saw that as an opportunity to say, this is the time for us to invade Ukraine? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know if, if, if it was the deciding factor, but clearly it looked like the Americans, the American military doesn't know what they're doing anymore. It appears that the generals actually had a different plan and were overridden by civilians uh, in the White House who don't, don't know what they're doing. So, so uh, I watched this documentary. Did, did you watch the one with uh, by Oliver Stone or no? No, I watched well, first the one with of, Sean Penn. Oliver Stone interviewed Putin God knows how many times, like 13, 14, I don't know the exact number, but multiple times. And he did this documentary, and he went to both sides, right? And it tells you the history of Ukraine and Russia. So one of the <clears> concerns <throat> for Putin is uh, a lot of the countries that were part of USSR are now – part of NATO, and it's 13 surrounding countries that are part of NATO, surrounding mm -hmm. Russia that are not part of NATO. So right. to him, 
That's a threat because NATO keeps getting stronger around Lithuania, there. Lithuania, yeah, ex- and, and Yugoslavia, these, all the, yeah. the Eastern Bloc. Basically. Yeah, Belarus. I mean, just take these guys, right? So, and he's sitting there saying, what is NATO's vision? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to control me? Are you trying to hold me? Mm-hmm. You know, those are the nations, right? Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czech, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Slovenia, mm-hmm. uh, Croatia, Montenegro. All Albania. right on their doorstep. Right there. So he's kind of like sitting there saying, what is going on here? So... Then you look at the history where years ago Stalin negotiated a treaty with Hitler to prevent Hitler from invading through Ukraine. That was kind of like the arrangement that they had. But Germany broke its promise and attacked Russia anyways, launching uh, Barbarossa, which uh, ended up being the largest military operation at the time. And at one point with Ukraine, this is why Nazi keeps coming up. At one point, Ukraine was aligned with Hitler. And SSS, well, I mean, with them, in 1941, 80,000 people from the Ukrainian, Ukrainian army fought for Hitler's army. Yes. So this is the part that gets a little tricky with what, you know, Putin's kind of like, do you guys know the history of what's going on? What, what, what do you know about this All right. rich let, history let, of it? Let, so, me, let me go, go a few years prior to that happening. You, you're, you're right on target here. And uh, quite frankly... Uh, this is not uh, being discussed in the media at all. It's like uh, I heard a, I forgot the name. Uh, I heard a senator the other day saying something like Ukraine has been a democracy for the last uh, 30 years. That's not true. It was an oligarchy uh, and, and it's still very corrupt today. It's not a democracy. So, But let me go back to history. Um, in, uh, Ukraine uh, bec- was sort of annexed by... I, th- I think it was still under Lenin and became part of the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was always uh, there have always been a two uh, uh, populations uh, in in Ukraine. There were the Russian speaking and the Ukrainian speaking, and the Ukrainians were more to, to on the Polish side. So anyway, so the 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 Western Ukrainians uh, there was a separatist movement. They wanted uh, to go get away from the Soviet Union. The other thing that happened in <clears throat> and uh, that's very interesting. The collectivization of the agriculture of the Soviet Union. You know, peasants don't like to be collectivized. They, uh, they, they want to own land, right? And once you take that land away from them, you take, you know, their way of life. Mm-hmm. So there was this phenomenal uh, amount of resistance, and so Stalin found a way to uh, um, starve them into submission. He. And it were mostly KGB agents and some others that went into Ukraine and stole all the grain for two years. They were, uh, and, and so the folks that actually uh, planted the grain and harvested it uh, had nothing to eat. There were four million Ukrainians that starved to death in those days. That is the reason for the phenomenal hatred that Ukrainians have today uh, vis-a-vis uh, uh, the, the Russians, even though Stalin wasn't a Russian, but you know, hatred is uh, is not rational. It, it, it was hatred against something that came from the east, <clears throat> and um, and so as a result, when Hitler came in, uh, there were enough Ukrainians thought uh, who, who thought you know that was liberation. It didn't turn out that way, <clears throat> but you you were right. There were <clears throat> about eighty thousand folks that uh, that uh, uh, fought on in Hitler's army. There were uh, uh, guards in concentration camps, Ukrainians who, who committed lots of atrocities. The most, uh, the most uh, infamous uh, nationalist was Stepan Bandera, mm-hmm. uh, anti-communist. He was, you know, and he was pro-freedom to the point where he he, he pissed a lot of people off. Well, he was also anti-Semitic. Yeah, he was. And 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 it, they hated it, Russians it, that much that they decided to yes, side with the Nazis. Yes. But they so were the enemy of my enemy is my friend basically. Exactly. But but they were also fundamentally evil. And so when Putin says, you know, there's there's Nazis in in uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, there's something to it. Uh, and in, in 2019 Ukraine issued commemorative stamps to honor the 100th birthday of Bandera. Mm-hmm. That's not a good sign. So there are... Some, That's I, what I'm saying. <clears throat> There's some stuff that the history that people... I don't know if enough proper investigative journalism has been done to know what's going on. There's some guys that are doing it right now, but... 
But this anti-Semitism is, is all over oh, Europe, yeah. the, especially Eastern Europe. But Eastern not, Europe, it's not oh, absolutely. But you know who? The, which, but do you know this guy, this Stephen Bandera guy? You know who put him in jail? You know yeah. who put him in jail during World War, World War II? Germany. Hitler put him in jail. Yes. I mean, for the, what? It, oh, because he was getting too. He was uh, too independent. Yeah, he was too independent, and they feared him, so they just oh. straight up put him in jail. And from jail. He was still mm. inspiring and moving people from jail. He was jail. He was still sending messages out to people. So this this guy right here, if you look at the screen, I don't know if David, you can show it or not. Uh, he played a very very big role uh, during that time. But I'm sorry, keep continue. Well, <clears throat> bottom line is, I there there are there's fascist uh, Nazi ideologies uh, still in Ukraine, but it's not prevalent. You know what we have there. There's a really really good book uh, that uh, was written by. Uh, Sean Walker, who was the correspondent uh, for for the Guardian in Moscow, mm-hmm. and he traveled all over the country. And the, the book uh, was called the the Long Hangover. It's about Russia of today, and he goes into the Russian uh, and uh, and Ukrainian uh, the relationship. And based on Sean's writing, th- there are no good people on either side. Now that book came out in 2019. It was before Zelensky was, uh, was elected. I think he's a good guy. Well, if I may, you know, the whole propaganda that Putin is using <clears throat> is that he's going into Ukraine to free Ukraine of Nazism. That's right. The ironic part about it is Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, is Jewish. Uh-huh. The first Jewish president they've ever had, I believe. And also the number two person, the prime minister, is also Jewish. So <laughs> it's like I'm trying to draw an analogy that you're saying, well, of course there's anti-Semites. In Ukraine, I'm sure that's everywhere. That's like saying there's racists in America, but we elected Barack Obama. So right, right, right. there's always going to be bad actors in every country. Yeah, and, but, w- but what they're talking about is the fact that Ukraine flips so much from pro-Russia, pro-Western, pro-EU, pro-Russia, pro-Western, pro-this. So, you well, know, it seems th- to be like half and half, though. If you're closer <coughs> to the Russian <coughs> side, you're going to be more pro-Russian. If you're closer yeah. to the Polish side or yeah. the EU side, you're going to be yeah. more and then, and then democratic. You have the battle of uh, the victors, you know, the two victors that went at it, right? Victor uh, uh, Yoshkinov, uh, Yoshenko, and then Victor, uh, uh, p- pronouncing it, Yanukovych. Okay, those Yanukovych, two went at it. Yeah. So uh, Yoshkinov, his wife was on Reagan's administration. Okay. Wow. Yeah, his wife was American? on Reagan's Yes, was on Reagan's. I don't know if she's American, but she was on Reagan's administration. <clears throat> gotcha. Okay. So, and then on the other side with <clears throat> uh, uh, Yanukovych, he was more on the other side. He was more pro-Russia. He was more, let's make it work. So the, the whole documentary with Winter on Fire that Sean Penn talks about, these kids are all excited. Students are excited. You know, the victor that's on pro-Russia sites, and we're going to sign this treaty with EU. We're going to sign this treaty with EU. We're going to do this. And then all of a sudden, last minute, they're like, no, we're not doing it. And then last minute we flipped, and then they're not doing it. So that led to the protesting, which led to ugly. I mean, I don't know if you saw these. It was pretty bad with yeah. the protesting and the rioting. And then eventually they get this guy on uh, uh, where Pope Francis comes out and prays for Ukraine on January 26th of 2014. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. At the end of his prayer, they let two doves go. Okay, very. In- it's, it's a little creepy if you watch this. They let two doves go. When these two doves are flying, no joke, a crow and a seagull attacks the two doves. Get out of here. And the audience is there like <laughs> panicking because it's all symbolism, right? right Everything's over there is about symbolism. They're like, oh my gosh. And they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Then eventually the seagulls and the crow leaves, which means that symbolized before things get better. You're going to make it. You're going to survive. But before things get better, things get you're going to get attacked by a crow and a seagull. Oh. So that's how some of the folks there take that as... You know, things can get pretty up. And then after that, January 24th, uh, January 26th was the day when Pope gave that message. February 24th is when they fulfilled their coup. Victor was kicked out. Victor called uh, Putin. Putin said, you can come. And he went to Russia. And that's where it was at. And then next thing you know, Zelensky shows up in 2019, 2020. Yeah. And you're saying he's a good agent. So going back to the question that we asked, there's a lot of skepticism right now uh, about what Putin's going to do, what Putin's not going to do. As a former KGB member yourself, in situations like this, right, like, you know, Yuri talks about demoralization, destabilization, you know, crisis, 
normalization, these phases you go through. And he even takes it deeper. Propaganda, disinformation, deception, sabotage, subversion, <clears throat> espionage, all these things that he talks about. And that's the playbook of KGB. Let's just say, if it is the playbook of KGB, if you could think to the best of your abilities on what the KGB was trained to do, the true believers, and you've heard Putin say there's no such thing as a former KGB. You've heard him say that before, like there's no such thing as a former KGB. What do you think his next moves are? What do you think he does in a situation like this? Because in the world right now, he's seen like the next Hitler. I don't want to really disappoint you, but that KGB training um, that he brags about um, wasn't that good for him. He was not, uh, he was not, he was not a well-trained agent. He uh, he's a masterful politician, and uh, clearly, you know, he, he, everybody in the KGB was familiar with it, but that kind of stuff. But but that doesn't mean that they were d- doing it very well. Yes, active measures was uh, particularly under Andropov. Andropov actually issued a. Uh, 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 a rule that every active KGB agent must be involved in some way in doing active measures. And so he was very much uh, for it. And, and there were a number of successes that they had, but it was not on a large scale. And I think I told you the last time that, you know, to, uh, they managed to uh, put, put this uh, big lie out there that uh, J. Edgar Hoover was a secret cross-dresser. Mm-hmm. And you're saying that was not true. It was not true. It was not true. Uh, there, there's a... The, the, that, um, Vasily Mitrokin was a KGB archivist, and he smuggled a lot of material out of, uh, of the archives. And uh, there, in his book, there's a section about ar- active measures, and there's a number of things where they uh, where he says, "Yeah, the KGB did uh, did this, that." For instance, the uh, Kennedy assassination, all the rumors that were floating around, they were init- initiated by the KGB and sort of uh, placed into Western media, friendly Western media, sort of left-wingish, and then picked up by the New York Times and so forth. Uh, that was successful, but this massive undermining of Western society, there, there's no, no such word. Uh, in, in Mitrokin's book, uh, he actually says that the, the, uh, the department that was responsible for active measures was the least desirable. You know, the agents, the good ones, all wanted to live in the West. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they had a lot of failures, but uh, uh, they succeeded uh, in particular specific situations. And uh, disinformation, you, know, this is, uh, you don't have to be a trained agent. Uh, that's uh, almost all governments do it, don't we? You know, we have an agenda. We, uh, we, we have a narrative, and uh, we only talk about the stuff that fits our narrative, Right. We do it too, on the left and on the right. Uh, so, and as I as I said, I think Putin is uh, probably the the smartest politician in the last one hundred years. Uh, I mean, really, it, think about it. He may he main, maintained power for twenty plus years in a country where the standard of living has not really improved. Mm-hmm. He uh, that means he he is a, a phenomenal manipulator of his own people. All right, they they they're buying into the the uh, you know the tale that, that that's that's one of the major narratives that that uh, uh, Russia is constantly under threat from from the West, and by uh, you know having ex Warsaw Pact countries join NATO, uh, we gave him some ammunition. I'm not saying we shouldn't have let them into NATO, but but there's some reality to it, and uh, uh, as uh, people who follow history know that. Uh, um, Russia has historically always been under attack since its foundation from everywhere. And so in, in, the, in the Russian national genetic makeup, there is a desire for a strong person, a strong leader. You know, this is succession. There were the, some of the czars. Then we had Lenin, we had Stalin, and now it's Putin because they're afraid of, of yet another invasion. That fear, in my view, is... Unjustified, but you know how do you how do you get this out of the you know the uh, the most primitive part of your brain, fear. Now, Jack, do you consider yourself German, Russian, American, all, all of above, just American? Now, where do you classify yourself right now? So, there's one one uh, answer I give to this. Uh, today, I'm legally 
uh, intellectually and emotionally an American, period, with German roots. But I wouldn't even use the hyphenation because uh, um, there's a difference between me and my my wife. Uh, she is also uh, has American citizenship, but uh, she was she's originally from Jamaica. When she says we, she means Jamaica. When I say we, I mean the United States, mm. and us and them is the Germans. Can you even go back to Germany? Oh yeah, or I have. Russia? I have. Uh, Russia, no. <laughs> you cannot go to Russia. No, not even close. No. Germany, yes, though. Germany, uh, I've traveled in in Western Europe uh, in, in several countries. I also was in Poland. Uh, Russia, no. You see, when when you show up there, accidents can easily mm -hmm. be arranged. In, in where Russia? Yeah, it's it's well, yeah. it's very don't very drink, difficult to don't drink what they give you. Yeah, it, it's very difficult to arrange an assassination. On foreign uh, in a foreign land, it's very difficult, and they don't have that many teams that can do that. Mm -hmm. But once you show up in Moscow, <laughs> and uh, and you know Putin is a master in sending messages to the world. Why did he go after Skripal? Uh, this this was uh, you know the the, the fellow that uh, uh, was poisoned in London. He he was already exchanged. That's the end. Normally in the espionage world, mm -hmm. uh, he was in jail, and he was then exchanged by the, by the Brits for. Uh, some, some folks that they were holding. Uh, that That is the end of the game. And he saw fit to just send a message, you know what, we, 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 can, get a, we can go after you no matter what. So that's why, why, why would I anyway go back to Moscow? I've been to St. Petersburg and, and Moscow and there isn't much else to be seen in, in, I, I in think Russia. He, I think he wants to go and he wants to go with you because I think Adam <laughs> likes the Russian ladies over there. That's completely There's enough in uh, Sunny Isles, <laughs> Florida. But, 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 go, go, can, go. can I ask you a question though, yeah, Pat? And sure. this is actually for the both of you. It's, I mean, you love America more than maybe anybody <clears throat> I know and you weren't born here. You've been very explicit that I'm full on American. I don't yeah. even use a hyphen. <clears throat> Do you think <clears throat> immigrants who have left other countries appreciate and love America more oh, than natural-born citizens? No doubt. Listen, I was walking uh, for, for about 10 minutes uh, outside in, uh, in the city here, and as, as I'm looking left and right, and I'm looking, oh, my God, we're such a rich country. It is totally amazing because I, and immigrants like me, we know where we came from, and there wasn't much there. Mm -hmm. and, and opportunities are everywhere if you want to take advantage of the opportunities. Um, and the one thing that unfortunately is not playing as big a role as it should is th that I mostly admire is the U.S. Constitution. I, I took a college course, a multi-session course about the Constitution. Absolutely brilliant document. We're talking about, we're talking about uh, how they uh, constructed the government so that minorities would be protected as opposed to when you have a democracy, if you if you have 51% of the votes, you can do whatever you please, and you can really run roughshod off the, over the 49%. So, yeah, it's... Incredible structure on how they had it. I mean, Hillary Clinton and some other people want to change it uh, to yeah. a different model, but uh, you're right. The, the structure is a... You know what he means by minorities. He does mean minorities like ethnicity-wise minorities. The 49%. Yeah. 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 Pat, where did your love for America really <laughs> manifest? Uh, uh, listen, you know, again, you have to, sometimes you appreciate a friend when you have a bad friend. Sometimes you appreciate a girl when you have a bad experience with another girl. Sometimes you appreciate a guy you date based on a different bad experience you have. Some of the best things that can ever happen to you is something bad that makes you realize, listen, it's time to be super grateful. What were you complaining about? So... The, the challenge with America, America has a gratitude problem. That's what it is. America's got purely a gratitude and a perspective problem. Those two things is what's hurting America more than I can tell you. Uh, we lack gratitude. We complain too much. We act like victims. And we don't realize that this is the greatest country in the world still. And uh, uh, rather than doing something with everything that's given to you, you complain about it. That's the biggest thing with me. This is the greatest country there. But going back to can, the can I chime in just yeah, with, sure. with one <clears throat> with one uh, uh, thing I want to say? Americans, right? Not all, but a large majority of Americans are either fat, dumb, and happy, or fat, dumb, and angry. We're fat. We're the, the most overweight nation of this, in the civilized world. Thirty-six percent overweight. Um, <laughs> we we, we, at? we we have 
dumbed down at least two generations of, of, of young people because we're not teaching critical thinking anymore. And uh, depending, you either, we're either happy because we, you know, we, we, we love entertainment, sports, and the mm -hmm. TV, and binge watching, and all that. And then we get angry uh, when things don't work, when we, we, we curse at each other in social media. That's, that's a, this is a systemic uh, issue in society that doesn't seem to have a, a good outcome if we don't find a way to... No, I, I agree with you. It's a very weird dynamic. The other day, Westbrook is complaining because somebody called him Westbrook, <laughs> and everybody's coming out and saying, well, it's not fair to talk to the person like that. What, whatever ever happened to... You know, sticks and bones, you know. Stones, 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 stones. Stones. <clears throat> yeah, so what, what, whatever happened to, you know, people can call you anything you want. Go complain about $40 million of your income. Okay, right. while you're going to your nice house, people are sitting trying to make 50, 60 grand a year, and they're really having to go through problems. You're worried about somebody's calling you West Brick because you're not practicing, <laughs> you're not shooting your free throws. Well, I'll give you one anecdote that, that sings um, to your story. It's, you know, I went to uh, the Freedom Forum uh, on behalf of... Uh, no. Gary Kasparov. Uh, Gary Kasparov yeah. invited me. I'm sure you're very familiar with Gary yeah. Kasparov, um, greatest chess player uh, to ever live. Um, and I interviewed a lot of essentially freedom fighters, the one Iranian lady that you know with, with the big hair, and the um, gentleman that I interviewed from Iraq, he basically hosts The Daily Show in Iraq, to put it in perspective. <laughs> He's like a comedian, satirist, um, huh. political pundit, uh, funny guy. And to your point about being, you know, fat, lazy, and happy, or, 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 or fat, lazy, and angry, and watch, you brought up reality TV, and just sitting around, and just right. whatever, he said, I wish, I go, what's your, your one wish, if you could, for the people of Iraq, I wish that we could just sit around and watch reality TV, and that's what I wish for the Iraqi people, meaning that there's so much drama, and so much conflict, and so much tyrannical abuse going on. That they can't even just sit down and watch TV for a half hour and just watch mindless shit. And that's what happens here in America yeah. is that we make our problems so much deeper than they really are compared to what's going on in the actual real world, to use a real world uh, The example. problem that with America sometimes is that they're too consumed with entertainment and not enough cons consumed with you know, uh, uh, education after graduating from high school or college. Education <laughs> stops for most people in America, <laughs> a lot, not most people in America, period. Most people, right. uh, the moment they stop going to college or they go to high school, they don't read books anymore, <laughs> they don't finish books, it's a romance <clears throat> novels, let me see the best movie, let <laughs> me see the best this, let me see the best that. So entertainment has, a, has sucked probably 40, 50% of most people's lives where they right. don't... You know, put enough time. But at the same time, that is one of our greatest exports. I don't rock and roll yes, entertainment. Yeah. No, no, no. You know, oh, the American oh, oh. culture. You're talking to a guy who loves music, who's excited yeah. about Elvis's documentary coming out. Who, no, I, I totally get it. But I think there's also an element of, uh, of, of being a little bit more educated mm -hmm. about history of what's mm -hmm. really going on. That's what I mean by that. I Absolutely. I, mean, I I now run into people, younger people, you know, late teens or early twenties. What? Oh, KGB. What's that? <laughs> you know the biggest war in history, World War Two, and, mm -hmm. and 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 this uh, the mass murder that happened in in the last century. People don't know. Yeah, and if they don't know, they might not see it coming. It's not totally uh, out of the question that the United States one day becomes a dictatorship. Happened in Germany. Yeah, you know, so so let's let's go there. Let's go there for a second. So, um, nobody thinks uh, they're gonna die from cancer until they have it. It's always like the other person. Oh, it's, the divorce is never gonna happen to me. You know, I, I'm never gonna get fired. Oh, I'm never gonna. It's never gonna happen to me. America, it's never gonna happen to America. There's no way to happen to America. Uh, what are five signs before something goes that way? That's the real question. Like, what happens to a nation that was a democracy, that was a republic? that led to the fall of that empire? What are a handful of things? Well, let me tell you, the, I think the, in my view, the, the most, the biggest sign is uh, when reason leaves the public discourse. And uh, unfortunately, there isn't that much left anymore. You know, and go back to critical thinking, you know. We're being manipulated like crazy. And, you know, are we ourselves immune? We're not, you know. How, how, many, how many times uh, 
do I find something that I believed in, and when I check it out, it wasn't true? Because you can't check everything, right? So that, I think, is, is, is the most important thing. The, the next one, uh, believe it or not, I think uh, humor, when humor leaves society. Mm. Wait, That's kind of to, to Adam's point. A, a person who cannot make fun of himself mm. is insecure. A nation that can't look at its own weaknesses honestly and make fun of them is insecure. But can't we also point to what's happening in Russia right now as an actual <clears throat> case example of where authoritarian regimes start to take over? Because Russia was, you know, marketed as a democracy after the fall of the USSR. Yeah, they had elections, let's put it this right, way. Yeah. Elections, 90% <laughs> voted right, for Putin. Right. A lot of air quotes going on <laughs> if you're not watching this. But here's some of the stuff that, that CNN covered on CNN Politics. Putin's autocratic vision for the Russian world. Hear the highlighted words. Censorship. Information mm -hmm. crackdown. Mass arrests. This is what dictators do. Authoritarian. Totalitarian. Uh, democratic experiment has failed. But, I mean, those types of things, you know, you, you, you hear um, if you speak out against the Russian army or whatever, you know, what Russians, you could go to jail for 15 years. Is right. that, those are actual examples of where democracy falls. That's, right? the, that's the extreme... Uh, um, a feature of cancel culture, right? Beyond, yeah, right. that's the extreme. We 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 cancel you, not just mm -hmm. your ability to speak, right? Um, yeah, thirteen thousand people arrested on mass arrest. Mm -hmm. Facebook and Twitter is now down over there. You mm -hmm. can't use Facebook or Twitter in uh, Russia. Uh, but but I want to go back to Putin. I want to go back to Putin. Okay, you think what like right now? Uh, half the battle of going up against the enemy is trying to figure out what his next three, five, ten moves are going to be, right? And you said something. You said this could get pretty ugly quickly, so we have to make sure we are moving accordingly with this guy. What do you think are his... If you were to speculate, obviously <clears throat> nobody knows we're not in the man's mind, but here's a former KGB member. You're saying he's the greatest politician on mm -hmm. what he was able to pull off. What do you think are his next three, five moves? Well, I, I do believe that uh, he has, as his primary goal uh, the occupation of the eastern part of Ukraine that may include Kiev and may not uh, I if he if he's still reasoning and smart he knows he can't occupy all of all of Ukraine without getting into a, an Afghanistan type situation that will eventually uh, be his undoing um, and and it's not because there's demonstrations uh, and Russians. I think the majority of, of the Russians don't want this war. But it's, mm -hmm. you know... <laughs> Interesting map right here, by the way. Yeah, yep. Uh, dictators can be deposed. Uh, there, there's palace coups in history all over the place. And uh, Putin needs to be aware that, I, I, I'm sure he is aware, that the... The, his inner circle, they're powerful people. Mm -hmm. and, and he needs to uh, find a way to stay at the top. That means, uh, you know, he showed proper aggression because he, they're looking for a strong man. Uh, but he can't get to a point where uh, his, his, his rule is eroded because of uh, the quagmire in, in Ukraine. So I heard this morning uh, that uh, uh, there are negotiations going on where there is a little more uh, uh, realism in the demands on, on either side. I think he needs to find an off-ramp. If he doesn't, he's done. Elaborate on he's done, on Pakistan. He's, he's done as a person, as an individual. Do you think someone's going to take him out? Uh, yeah. You mean not not immediately and, and and maybe not necessarily killing, but you know, taking him out because he has he, he politically it, taking him out or, politically, or literally taking him out. Uh, no, no, politically. Uh, did you see that? There's a picture in, in the in the media where he's surrounded by uh, all his bodyguards. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. they are the, the best trained uh, the, the, the commando in the, in the world. I would think so. He would be hard to take out unless 
in, in I'm not advocating any of that unless you know where he is and, and th throw a nuke in, into that. You brought up his inner circle, right? The Russian oligarchs, yeah, yeah. I don't know, maybe political well, uh, look, look, inner the, circle. The generals, the, yeah. uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the intelligence services, they all have power on their own. Who do you think he actually <clears throat> listens to? Nobody really knows that, right? They, and there's also no, uh, no clear succession plan. You know, he's going to be 70 very soon. It's not clear who would succeed him. So, mm -hmm. that, that's and he's going to be in power until a, 2036, I believe. <laughs> if he lives that long, that's a weakness of the state. If you don't have a succession plan, it could be chaotic once once he disappears. Uh, it's it's the, the the future of Russia doesn't look very good because right now economically he's he's getting killed, crushed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 60 right. yeah, crushed absolutely. 40 percent the currency is dropped in the last whatever eight, nine, ten days. Mm -hmm. The and they want to get 60 trillion rubles back from the mm -hmm. people. I mean, that's insane if you do something like that. What's this right here? Lindsey mm -hmm. Graham stands by call for someone in Russia to assassinate Putin. I saw that a few days ago, right? See, he should shut up already. You can say that in private. Lindsey Graham? Yeah. 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 But well, by, by the way, you saw, you saw the fact that an yeah. insider from Russia released information that there's already been three assassination attempts on Zelensky. Uh, <clears throat> oh, and uh, nobody. And then the questions ask: How many assassination attempts have been made on Putin? Nobody knows, right? Because it have to be from the inside. Yeah, yeah. But there's already been three. By the way, you know how many assassination attempts there was on Hitler? Forty-two plus. Right. Yeah. And yeah. eventually, he killed himself. Killed himself. Yeah. So, Pat, do you have a, an opinion on who you think Putin would listen to? I, I I think I think Putin's a true believer. You have to negotiate with true believers in a different way. Like you ever talk to somebody and you say, "But you don't understand what he did," but you will never understand it. Mm -hmm. But you will never understand. No matter what you say, that person goes to what? But you will never understand it. Like there's so much emotion behind that. How do you eliminate all that emotion? If if that's any like like parents get a divorce, my mom and I got a divorce. No matter what's said. That the, the emotion is so deep between the two, mm -hmm. nobody can do anything about it, right? It's that deep of what that emotion is. You just heard the history of what happened with Russia and how it went back and forth and how he views Ukraine and what he thinks of Ukraine. You know what he thinks about him? He looks at Zelensky and he says, this is not a leader. I would do laps around this guy. How do you guys buy uh, into an actor being your president who created a political party on a TV show and he... Starts uh, uh, political. Uh, look at Trump. But but I I totally. <laughs> but to him, yeah. To, you got to think about to Putin. To Putin is like, who are you to sit across? Like, who do you think you are? You're a nobody. Putin's a true believer. So, uh, you know, for me, I already said it yesterday when we talked about it. I think uh, the best offense is what? Well, what's a good what, defense? A good defense. America had a good defense prior to Biden. America had a pretty good defense prior to Biden. Biden's not scaring anybody. So everybody's playing offense because our defense sucks right now. Defense is how you handle Afghanistan. That's a terrible defense. We did not have a good oh, defense. Yeah. <clears throat> you don't intimidate anybody when you don't have a good So what do we do about it? So he's being opportunistic about it. Uh, my only concern is, again, it goes back to the same thing. My only concern is how far is he willing to go out? The reason why I called Jack this week and I said, Jack, we want to have you on. And we, I, we just called you this week, by the way, or maybe Sunday or Monday. No, it was Friday. Actually, actually Monday. It was Monday. Yeah. Okay, it was Monday. So Monday, two days ago, right? I said, Move I want to. quick. <laughs> yeah. And we, we flew him out because I want to know what he's thinking and I want to know what his moves are going to be. Mm -hmm. What What is a former kid? Yeah, I want to know what is, is how, how much of it is a bluff game? How much of a. Uh, um, we don't know. That's what I'm saying. Well, he, you've he, used the analogy he, multiple times that he's got, he's, you know, he's got pocket twos and he acts like he's, you know, has a straight in his hand. You've used this analogy. Yeah, I, I wonder, like, is he bluffing? Because he's so in too deep now that it's very hard to paint a picture for him to redeem himself. History may be done with him. Like, you have to realize, history well, may be... he's a pariah on the world stage, no doubt at this point. Oh, but just three weeks ago, uh, just two months ago, it wasn't, though. That's my point. Yeah, but history may be done with him. So in his mind, is he sitting there like, hey, I was doing this for my dad. I was doing this for my legacy. I was doing this for M Mother Russia. I was doing this for this. Who is his loyalty to? Is, it the, is he worried about the people around him that are upset with him, that he may lose power, that somebody that wants to replace him? Because he's 69 years old right now. Is he thinking that? Hey, his loyalty is, is to himself, first of all. <clears throat> Secondly, I want to add, add a feature here. Uh, when you, you had Zelensky's picture up there, he doesn't look like a 
a strong individual physically. Putin has a black belt in karate. Putin has cultivated an image of being a real tough guy. Uh, you, you know that infamous picture of him riding a horse? Mm -hmm. No shirt on. No shirt yeah. on. And uh, for quite some time, I think he stopped doing this. He got too old. He would have an, uh, participated in a, ho in a hockey game, mm -hmm. annual hockey game, where he and four others took on the starting five of the national team. Yeah. And Putin always scored the goals. Right. He yeah. always had a hat trick against oh, the best players in e the world. Exactly. So, right. I mean, so it's he, ridiculous. This this is so ridiculous, but he believes that he can pull it off, and he actually seems to be pulling it off because I have a video of, of one of the games, and, uh, you know, he scored a goal in, tw in the first 20 seconds, and everybody screams, yeah. So so that's that's the It's image. kind of like when you let the little kid run down the football field and all the yeah. <laughs> the tacklers move out of the way and the 6-year-old scores a touchdown. I mean that's essentially what he's doing. It's propaganda. So so he has created that image of himself as a strong man and he believes in it because you know if well, more importantly than he believes in it, the Russian people believe too. in it. Yes. How do they fall for the propaganda propaganda time and time again, especially with him? Well, and, and, I have been lately uh, watching quite a few documentaries about, uh, you know, how Hitler came to power and, and how he uh, he ran the Third Reich. Uh, how did the Germans believe all that nonsense? How would they all go like this in unison? Uh, and, and, and and that was an, an educated populace. Do you think Putin is an extremely sensitive guy? Yes, and I, I tell I you... I think he's hypersensitive. Okay, so... <laughs> You know why I'm asking that? I think you know where I'm going with this. Do you think he's super hypersensitive? Yes, and I, I tell you why I know this. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a fellow by the name of Oleg Kalugin. Uh, he was uh, KGB. He was in charge of uh, counterintelligence uh, for the first directorate. First directorate was espionage. I was in the first directorate. Uh, and uh, at one time, he was Vladimir's boss. And I met Oleg a couple of times. He lives in the United States. He's a citizen. And uh, he said, you know, he, he wasn't he, he wasn't much of a good agent. But there's, he said, there's one thing I will not do. He, I will not say anything. I will not attack him personally. Apparently, he may know something that would uh, be Putin's undoing. Talk, talking about sensitivity, and I'm not going to mentioned that on, on air, so there were some hints, but there, there, apparently it's a great, great sensitivity because of that ego, the narcissism, mm -hmm. right? And uh, There uh, has to be, there has to be something that, to be at that level, you have to be hypersensitive about yes. something. And, and, and running around, uh, you know, American politicians and, and calling them all kinds of names is, is not necessarily doing us any good. And it could just... I don't, I don't disagree. Make it more crazy. I don't disagree. Yeah, I don't disagree. Pat, why do you ask that question? What, what were you, what were you hypersensitive? Yeah. Oh, all I'm saying is if you're dealing with somebody hypersensitive, you have to... The ability to tame yeah. is, 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 a, is, a, is a political uh, skill. Like skill. He, he's got... They got... Uh, yeah. The, so it, the more sensitive he is, the more dangerous he is to the world. And I think he's very sensitive. I think he's extremely hypersensitive. So I think... Whoever makes the next moves with them, mm -hmm. they have to make it the right way. By the way, props to Zelensky for not attacking back and doing any of that. He's, he's saying, listen, man, I'm, not, I'm just fighting you back, but I'm not hurting you. Yeah. They're taking the soldiers and they're holding the soldiers and the soldiers are apologizing. They're making a video. I don't know if you've seen those videos where the soldiers who Ukraine takes from Russia Russian soldiers. and they're prisoners of war. They're saying on video, man, I'm sorry, I'm just doing my job. They're just telling me what to do. There's hundreds of these videos, propaganda. by the way. No, 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 not propaganda. Actual Russian soldiers. No, meaning are, that's what they're using to win the yeah, hearts and minds yeah. of other people. Yeah, so, so what is it? Is it fear? Do you fear it? Are you worried what could happen? Are you worried what he's going to do? And so you said something. You said his loyalty is only to himself. I, I don't know if I, 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 I believe that. I think, I think it is to himself, but I think it's... It's, is it a Lenin? Is it a Stalin? Is it a? Th there's got to be something more than that. And to be able to handle this guy, you got you got to do it in a very 
It's too late. The strategy of Trump doesn't work with Biden mm-hmm. right now. You can't go from not being a tough guy to being a tough guy. Yeah. Like, remember when Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio all of a sudden started talking trash to Trump? Yeah, it didn't work. And everybody's like, what the hell are you doing? That's not your identity. Stop it. You look mm-hmm. funny. You're not a troll. Trump's a troll. You're not a troll. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't try, try to, to play in the mud. Uh, no, you, this guy lives in this the guy's mud. been a troll yeah. for his entire life. He's a pro. He comes from the streets of New York. He's a tough guy. You're not a tough. What are you doing, Ted? Right. What are you doing? So it didn't look. Not a good look. So him. Biden cannot play the card of Trump. Trump's been that his entire life. I don't think he's life. trying to, though. No, right? he's not. He's not trying to. And I think for the most part, especially with the um, the address he gave last week, I think Biden has looked capable. I'm not. I don't think he's looked strong or tough, but it looked like he's making sense. Uh, yeah, I can't. I, I agree. I, I can't disagree with uh, the way we have been handling the situation. I cannot. Um, now, the only thing that clear-thinking people disagree with is that we were not opening up the American oil spigot again. Right, which I think is coming. I think that's the next step because mm-hmm. we just put a ban on Russian oil. Right. Right. Yeah, and we're, I th- we're too busy courting Iran and Venezuela and everybody else. Why would we open up our own pipelines? Yeah, I mean, that's that, that right there, if you think about that. That is the, the – matter of fact, I'll read that story. Go to page two down, Bongino. Uh, uh, ba, 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 ba. Which one is that, Bongino? Uh, Biden administration courts Venezuela, Iran, and Saudi Biden, Arabia. Biden administration story. courts Venezuela, Iran, and Saudi Arabia for oil while ignoring U.S. producers. The, has found themselves in a position where they need more oil – production to lower gas prices but can't do that domestically without alienating the large anti-fossil fuel portion of the base and breaking their own promises as gas prices top four dollars nationally and seven dollars in some cities they're instead yeah. opting to beg venezuela iran and saudi arabia for mm-hmm. bailout this comes days after biden proved the release of 30 million barrels from the strategic petroleum reserve for reference 30 million barrels isn't even enough to cover two days of u.s oil consumption with the possible exception of Saudi Arabia, Biden would rather fund a list of America's enemies than boost our own oil industry. So, so you got Russia, what they're going through. You got us, how we're reacting to economical crisis that we're having here today, right? These are two different things that's going on. That's Putin. This is uh, U.S. And Biden, every time he's asked, he, he was asked a question yesterday. I don't know if you saw that, Tyler. He was asked, are gas prices going to go up? Yes. What are we doing about it? Uh, we can't do nothing about it. It's because of Russia. So, <laughs> he said that yesterday in a question in the back. I don't know if you saw that or not. Person asking that question. So lower and middle income families are paying a price for this. That's what. That's who's paying a price for that. That's a complete different conversation. Though. This, this is another case where uh, um, ideology is trumping reason. And I'm not using Trump because of Donald Trump. It's, it's, it, this is an ideology, the, the greening of the world. It, it, no matter how you look at it, what we are doing here doesn't make any sense because American companies pump oil cleaner and produce whatever the, the derivative of oil much cleaner than all the other countries. So it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. There's, there's no clear thinking. It's an ideology. It's a religion mm-hmm. with Greta as the... Did you see the story about the, 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 did you see the story from LA Times and all over the place whether Vladimir Putin is terminally ill and dying of cancer? A former Russian intelligence officer and others believe so. Did you see that story? I didn't see I'll it, and, it and, and, and I'll believe it when Vladimir dies from cancer. Okay, so you think that's another story that's being made up? <clears throat> yeah. Want to know one reason why many people think in uh, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin has execu- executed the invasion of Ukraine so quickly and suddenly he's dying? According to reports citing a former Russian intelligence officer who now Works for the Pentagon, Putin could be suffering from terminal bowel cancer. His puffy face seen in images this year could indicate he is undergoing chemotherapy treatments on steroids. The Daily Star reported this in their story that quoted the source. The source says this diagnosis could have encouraged him to be more aggressive and attack Ukraine so he can leave a legacy knowing he is dying. He added that analysis, have been studying Putin who think he has a terminal illness. And here's another source quoted from the Daily Star in the past. <clears throat> We've seen him smile, but in 2022, there are a few pictures of him looking happy. His look suggests he is in pain, and our people suggest his angry look is most likely as a result of being in agony. Our people are confident he is ill. He is concerned about COVID as he keeps his staff as a, at a distance. Uh, 
how much credibility you think there's behind this? Uh, none. I mean, I mean how <laughs> would you ever yeah. even... So, so this guy, the, the ex-intelligence agent, is a doctor, a medical doctor. He can, he can see this. I, 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 could, I could understand that uh, Vladimir doesn't sleep very well these days, works really hard, so that shows in your face. And this is just wishful thinking, and you're, you're muddling the picture. Just you got to deal with what you know is, is the truth. Well, remember when they did this with Kim Jong Un for like a couple months? Yeah. They were like, "Yeah, he's sick. He's, yeah. We found his twin. It's not What's really the strategy him. He's gaining that? weight. He's got the gout. What, what is the strategy? It's, it's of clipping. That? To do what? Oh, it's just a story you're saying. It's just to get views. I no, mean, no. it's <clears throat> okay. No, but what I'm saying is, why is a intelligence guy that now works at uh, uh, Pentagon? What is his motive to release that? Not not media. He's not trying to do clickbait. To, What's his motive? To get his name out. I mean, how big of how big of an official? I would is be he? so upset if you were working for me. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? I, what are you doing to get your name out? You think this is one of the best things that Chief Disguise Officer, CIA agent uh, Jonah Mendez told me? She said the best qualities about a CIA agent, intelligence agent, mm -hmm. is what? You're charming. You're charismatic. You're this. You're that. You're this. You're handsome. You're a great salesman. But when you save the world from World War III, you don't tell anybody about it because you don't need the recognition. She said that's a quality. Yeah. What are you doing being that's intelligent for Pentagon? such a unique character, by yeah. the way. But I get it. To but you have all those great qualities and don't tell anybody? <laughs> my, my question would be is how high ranking is the official? I mean, re remember Anonymous? That was supposed to be the super high ranking Trump official that wrote the big paper back in, what, 2017? You they saw Anonymous were, came out the other day. Right, and he was yeah. a low-level staffer that nobody knew. I, I, I would venture to say it's, it's similar with this guy. Okay, let's talk about Russian spies. Here's a story about Russian spies, okay, on page three. <clears throat> and, and, and I'm curious to know how much credibility you're giving to this one. Uh, Russian spies among us. A look at New York compound that houses Kremlin's intelligence officer. The complex, uh, known as Russian diplomatic compound in New York City's Riverdale neighborhood, has often been the subject of speculation surrounding the building's purpose and residence uh, uh, practices. The building is home to Russian diplomats, many of whom work in the United States as intelligence officers, there are two types of intelligence officers, those who pose a symmetrical threat and those who pose an as asymmetrical threat. Those working in New York and living in the compound and working at the mission in the United Nations are under diplomatic cover. It's called a symmetrical threat. We know they're here. They're diplomats under diplomatic cover, so they actually have all the privileges of diplomats, and they've uh, been caught conducting cover so they actually have uh, uh, espionage against our country. You can't throw them in jail because they're diplomats. But they're different from undercover operatives who are not uh, under the official cover and are in the United States. Those who pose as asymmetrical uh, threat, undercover operatives such as Jack Barsky, who operate under non-official cover under false pretenses with fake names. What do you want to say that, that article fails to mention the third category. What's that? Uh, people who are not undercover. They're not uh, assuming a, a, another identity. They work officially as as journalists, uh, business people, students, right? They 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 have an official reason to be here, but then they spy. And I think those are the ones right now that. Uh, uh, that we, we have to be aware of uh, um, because, you know, we're a very open country. How many, how many Chinese uh, exchange students do we have? Uh, and, and I guarantee you, <clears throat> Russia and China and all, all those dictatorships know exactly who is going abroad, and they all will be talked to. So there's, there's, a, good, there's a good reason to believe that there are currently more people in the United States, Russians, that uh, are engaged in espionage than they were in my time. Because there wasn't, in my time, there wasn't that free exchange of, you know, students and uh, teachers and, uh, and business people uh, back and forth. There, in those days, we had the two types, the asymmetric threat, us, and there were very few of us, very few uh, in the... Undercover, you mean? Yes, like undercover, asymmetric. deep okay. cover, yes. Deep cover. Uh, in, in the 80s, according to Matrokin, uh, there were, uh, early 80s, late 70s, there were about t 10 of us that were uh, trained and sent to the U.S., 10. Uh, and there were a couple of other, prior to, the, uh, to that period, there were, um, there were a couple of other uh, efforts to bring uh, those types of agents into the U.S., and they never amounted to many, okay? 
Uh, so, and, and here's, here's one other difference uh, between the uh, uh, KGB and Putin's intelligence services. The KGB was very solicitous of their agents. They were, they di did not like it when an agent was caught. They were, you know, they, they and and if we, if and when we were caught, they did everything to get us out. Uh, Putin enjoys when we catch people, because you know he, it scares us. You know, how many more of those are there? I guarantee you, quite a few. Oh, he likes it when we catch people. Oh, why not? Because it makes him. It even gives more a message. It gives a message that we got on the inside. Yes, that we're here. It's game we're playing. Not going anywhere. It's gamesmanship. How many? Reverse it. How many people, how many Americans or, you know, people on the American side of things or on the EU side of things even are implanted in Russia or even China for that matter? I would, that's, that's an educated guess, far fewer, far fewer. They're better at it than we are. That's yes, they are. And, um, <laughs> you know, or it's just easier to blend in in America. How many versus people want to live in Russia? How, 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 uh, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> yes. Uh, how many people would, uh, you know, it, it would be a sacrifice as opposed to coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. You get a good life and you do something patriotic for your country. That also played a role, uh, for me signing up right. in those days. <laughs> but uh, like you, how many people fall in love with the benefits of living in America and say, eh, KGB life ain't for me anymore. I'm just going to stay here for a while. Yes, but uh, you've got to be careful. There's always relatives in, uh, back home, uh, and you may be married uh, and with children. Uh, so and it's not that easy to defect. And, uh, you know, and if you want to play the double agent game, that's very dangerous. And the people that uh, the, 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 this category of uh, uh, official cover but, but not di under diplomatic protection uh, – this category is not well trained. They don't get. You say, when in 2010, uh, there were like 10 uh, SVR agents, uh, Russian agents, were uh, arrested by the by the FBI, and they were like very poorly trained. There's a there's a short video, an FBI video on YouTube, where you can see uh, some of their operations. And when I saw this for the first time, I was screaming at the TV, "You can't do this! This is wrong!" <laughs> what 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 role you think what role you think uh, um, NGOs play? You know what NGOs are. Non what yeah, role I know. do you think they play? Right. Like, hey, we're just a charity here, oh, a non governmental no, no. organization. No. We're creating it here, and humanitarian. We're here to save your country and help you out. And then meanwhile, behind closed doors, they're playing their games. And uh, yes, uh, historically, even the KGB did a really good job uh, infiltrating. NGOs in those days, uh, y yes, I, you got to be wary of those. Why? Why is that? Well, because you know they have a they operate under a cover, and many of them stand for a good cause, so they can attract people to do something uh, for them under false flag. Let's say some kind of a peace organization. We are for peace in the world, and then and then you can uh, under this flag you can uh, recruit somebody who has access to secrets state department you know just like help us out you know we we need to have equality in the world how, how does the country that knows what the motive of many ngos are how do you say oh yeah yeah come on in here we know you guys want to do good come come help us out why why, why do why do they permit <clears throat> for that take take place this is a guess but uh, you know if you you, you attack the, uh, groups that are serving a good cause you've got a pr problem big one right like i mean you know uh, uh, did you see what award hillary clinton got from forbes yesterday can you go to his forbes instagram account yesterday by the way did you see it i think <laughs> i sent it to you this morning yeah award. i sent it to you this morning yesterday the international Forbes. what oh you didn't see this no. uh, uh obviously she's known as the, the biggest uh, sweetheart uh, you go to go to instagram mm -hmm. and then type in forbes uh, just type in Instagram Forbes. I want to. I want to read this to you because then I want. I want. I want you to see the commentary. Um, so yesterday they posted this. Go to right there. Okay, click on that and make it bigger so we can see the comments as well. 
uh, 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 make it bigger in the in the comment section. It's important mm -hmm. to the world. <clears throat> Uh, I think if you care about Fidel, not this one. No, not this one. They gave the right. Yeah, they, I think if you care about Fidel, 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 they gave her recognition yesterday, and it was on Instagram. Um, anyways, she got the recognition as a women. Um, let me see this here. Where is that at? Uh, uh, Hillary, Hillary Rodham, Rodham Clinton receives Forbes, Forbes International Women's Day Lifetime Achieve Award. Right, mm -hmm. that's the one. Uh, I don't know if you have that or not. They posted that, but I want you to go to the commentary. Is that the one? No. Okay. Anyway, so so if you go to the comment mm -hmm. section with that and what people are saying, uh, they're saying, wait, is this a joke? Are you serious? Is this real? Uh, uh, are you really recognizing her for what she's got? You remember when she was going through, uh, go to comment section. Uh, and I'm out. Thank you, Forbes. She got a puffed up face. Maybe she has cancer too. But she's smiling, so she's <laughs> probably happy, right? <clears throat> if she didn't win, Forbes would be committed suicide. Da, 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 da. The point is this. She was the one that went to Haiti for humanitarian causes, right, to help out Haiti. And then all of a sudden, a few billion dollars went missing. I may be wrong, but I remember reading that story. Yeah, I, 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 I met uh, a, a diplomat uh, a while ago who, from Haiti. And I asked him uh, how much of that money went to the people who needed it, and he said zero. But it was such a marketing campaign. Yes. And so Achievement Award, what did she achieve? Uh, reset with Russia. You know, that sent a signal also to Europe that it was okay. You know, Russia will be okay. We can play ball together. And, and that, that uh, helped Putin to create this energy dependency uh, and, and, uh, that Western Europe has on, on on Russia right now. Now, what an achievement! What an achievement you know by Forbes. They could have given this to Oprah. Oh, are you kidding? Me? <coughs> I can give you fifty Rye other names. Or, like, why? I don't understand the fascination <laughs> with Hillary Clinton. Legitimately, like, what what has she done specifically to earn this award? It's another word that starts with the letter F, but it's not fascination. <laughs> it's called fear. Okay, it's called fear. It's not fascination. It's why are people afraid? Let's just give her recognition to get on her good side. You don't know what's going on. By the way, first of all, ninety-five percent of Forbes is now owned by China, and Malcolm Malcolm Forbes is right now probably in his grave, turning you know, his turning, grave. saying, "Why did you sell a company that's all about the capitalist tool to China? Why would well, you do that?" What does Steve Forbes have to say? Currently, with Steve Forbes, I, I don't understand that concept. I, I don't understand. Well, he's that constantly concept. on Forbes. I mean, I'm sorry, on Fox, giving his opinions. I'd love to interview him. I'd love to have him on. But matter of fact, can you, can him you invite him? Can you have Rob? Uh, uh, let's let's see if we can get him here because I'd be curious to know what, uh, why you would do such a thing. But let me continue. Let me continue with a couple other stories here that we got going on. Ukraine uh, too. Airfields, uh, which one was it that we wanted to go through? Um, okay, yeah, Russians offering Syrians $300 to, to fight in Ukraine. Uh, uh, U.S. European allies discuss banning imports from Russia. Obviously, U.S. already did it uh, by banning it, but now other countries are also talking about they may be doing it. Europe relies on Russia for crude oil and natural gas, but has become open the idea of banning Russia. Probably they've already done that, but then you got uh, a, a few other countries that are looking at that. Uh, look, how do, you, how do you stop this right now? If, if you wanted to stop this right now with them, like if you were to say, here's this country is going to matter, that country is going to matter, this country is going to matter, this sanction is going to matter, this challenge is going to matter, this fear is going to matter, how do you stop Putin right now? You, know, you, you got to be stick to your guns and be consistent. Uh, and I'm a little bit concerned uh, with um, possibly the German government, for instance, uh, getting too aggressive because, believe it or not, when I went back to Germany, and there was during the Trump uh, administration, the Germans I talked with would have sided with Putin over Donald Trump. The Germans, the German population, forgot what the United States did for them in World War Two, and so there is a significant. And, and I, I've, I've, had, I've had some emails coming out of Germany. Significant segment of the population that is actually on Putin's side, and Germany has elections. So now, see, this is where it gets really uh, difficult. Uh, Putin's side, why? Why? 
Oh, I, a friend of mine who, who um, best, my best friend, who was uh, who worked as a chemist in the Stasi, um, for, for, headed the forgery department. So he still has some... The, my generation has residual uh, communist I ideology. They couldn't get rid of it completely. And so they're looking at Russia sort of... Uh, um, with a, with a whole lot more sympathy, and and this friend of mine who's very bright uh, thinks this whole thing is, has been engineered by the United States because uh, the United States' uh, biggest aim is to uh, separate Germany and and Russia, so to speak, because a union, sort of a coalition of Germans and Russians, could be a a strong uh, counterforce against the United States. Germans don't like the United States. That's a that's a fact, you know. We're the big bully, uh, and and it's a shame. So, the, I'm and and French, you know, the French don't like us that much either. <laughs> I mean, at least enough of them, and so it's uh, it's a it's a difficult uh, very, you know balancing act here. To you know, you, you want to stick to your guns, you know, it, it's gonna it's gonna get painful for Europe. More so than us. Uh, yeah, when you look at the map, you know, the conversation we had yesterday about the fact that, hey, U.S., your neighbors are who? Canada and Mexico. What are you afraid of? Right. Nothing. You got Canada, you got Mexico, everybody else. You got to fly a long ways to come here, right? Who's the neighbors of Russia? Shoot, China, all these other NATO <clears throat> nations. You know, if you just look at that map right there, uh, 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 Russia, get, get, can you make that bigger for, for us to see it? Just make it bigger. Okay, there you go. So you got Russia, you got Ukraine, Belarus, and Latvia, the biggest Estonia, country in the world. They're surrounded the, by all Georgia. sides. Yeah, so it's... Um, but you're saying German is playing a different role now, meaning they're kind of aligning themselves with Russia? No, 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 no. I'm talking about saying. the German population. Oh, I got I'm you. I'm talking yeah. about the people who vote. The, the the German government surprised me phenomenally because, you know, what was supposed to be uh, a more conservative government under Merkel uh, was really weak. And, and this socialist just made a radical 180-degree about face about uh, his stance towards uh, defending his own country. That, that's what Trump wanted them to do, you know, and that's, they hated Trump for that because he walked into Germany and told him, you know, come on and pay up. Uh, do something for in your own defense. So, so, so he's now committed to to spending two percent of his GNP on on defense, and uh, you know the the and he's he's uh, pretty aggressive with the embargo. I, they're talking about even not buying natural gas. That would be a huge problem because, you know, under Ang Angela Merkel, they they had a very very um, uh, poorly. Um, um, arranged uh, uh, energy policy. You know, when they, you, when you go to Germany nowadays, you see windmills all, all over the place, and and the their electricity is like three times more expensive than ours because, you know, it's, uh, they they shut down the nuclear plants. So well, what's the whole concept of the Nord Stream two? They're going to shut that off, Tyler. I know you uh, have done some research mm -hmm. on that, right? Well, yeah, so Nord Stream 2 was a pipeline that would go direct from Russia to Germany and skip Ukraine. Ukraine makes like $5 billion a year <clears> transporting <throat> oil from Russia to Germany, and this would go straight to to Germany from Russia. And uh, excuse me, Germany buys, I think, 40% of their oil comes from Russia. So everybody wants to talk about American energy independence, gas prices. That we, we were exporting oil to the rest of Europe. Energy is a form of defense, and it can be manipulated into – not a form of war, but but uh, almost a, again again a form of defense. So if we if we export oil to Europe, we can make Europe stronger by cutting off dependence on Russian oil, Saudi oil, Iranian oil, Venezuelan oil, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's so it's so much bigger than just lowering the price at the pump. I mean, we we were we were a net exporter under President Trump, and as soon as President Biden came in, that's that's switched, and and gas prices have been up and rising since the beginning of. Joe Biden's presidency. This didn't start with Russia, Ukraine. I mean, at the beginning of his, his presidency, gas prices started rising. And it isn't just the gas because of, uh, because everything else that we buy somehow is impacted by energy prices. And that's what, uh, and if Biden thinks he can get a uh, 
grip on inflation is, is going to get worse. Yeah, I, yesterday I was consulting with this one guy who owns a construction company, and they do not construction company, transportation company, truck. So he does loads. And he says, uh, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? He says, you know, uh, prices for my uh, uh, loads that I'm delivering, it, it's gone up. I said, uh, by how much? He says, gas, I mean, 25%. And I don't know how to talk to my customers about it. I said, well, you got to be open about it. They know what's going on with gas prices. He says, but a lot of them are not open to the idea. I said, it doesn't matter. you got to have a conversation with them, right? Meaning, hey, instead of this is going to cost $3,000, it's going to cost now $3,700. What do you mean you're going to increase it by that much? So he, the person that's transporting, is going to say what? Well, I was normally paying $3,000 to transport. Now I have to pay $3,700 to transport. It's up 22%. So this product that you normally would buy for $3 is now $3.75. Okay, this product you buy that's $10 is now $12. I don't have a choice. Gas prices is not just about what it costs to go to the gas station. Right. No, it's about transportation. Yeah, exactly. But think, think about everything that's made with oil. Over 6,000 products are made with plastic. oil. That doesn't yeah. it, Exactly. That doesn't yeah. include everything that's made with adhesives, with plastics, yep. w- with rubber, vests. Everything is touched by oil. I mean, prices, yeah. it's so much more than just the gas Medication, price. drugs. By the way, with, with, with this going on right now, uh, Jack, who, who is happy? Okay. Who, which world leader right now sitting around saying, I'm so glad this is going on because it took so much distraction off of me? China. I agree. And why do you think they're happy? What, what, do, you, what do you think they're well, doing Well, they're right sitting now? back, right? And they're watching this. Um, you know, fundamentally, the, the Western Alliance and Russia are weakening each other right now. Mm-hmm. No doubt about it. There's no clear winner. China sitting back is not involved. And they're just waiting to see... When they can strike against Taiwan, you're saying? Yeah, no, sure. And that, what's the likelihood that that happens? Uh, I don't know. Um, it, it's probably more than fifty percent for them to get. There's just yeah. going to be a lot easier, by the way. Because who's because, going to get in the way? Because they've been stating this for, for you know the, the one China policy is, is official policy. They're just waiting for the right time to do this, and you know this looks pretty good right now for them, right? I mean. But we we already like the United States. Their main enemy is already pretty much focused on Russia now. So what are we going to do when they when they start uh, taking over Taiwan? Well, here here's a different perspective. Is there any doubt that China could just go take over Taiwan in a day or two? Done, right? Yeah. People also said that about Ukraine, right? And Ukraine is kind of holding their <clears throat> own, but the backlash is what I'm <clears throat> referring to. The pariah that Putin is becoming. China is kind of teetering, like they've been doing this balancing act where they're yeah, they're sure. kind of like this bad actor, but people are still kind of doing business with them and and buying products. But if they invade Taiwan, where do you think the the global sentiment will will direct itself against China? Well, it, basically, it, as the big bully. You but don't it, think it, so? It will be harder uh, to boycott China than it is to boycott Russia simply because you would empty all the Walmart shelves. You know, everything that I buy has, is, is made in China these days, right? So, and, and including, including uh, you know, medications and stuff like that, and things that are important. We have let go of control, and I think it had something to do with uh, uh, unregulated control capitalist greed follow the money it's, it's, it's not a rosy picture that, that uh, and I don't know you, you got to hope that the Chinese really like the way they're going now you know um, you know stealing secrets from the United States uh, you know and uh, and doing great business with the United States which helps them uh, controlling their own population you know by Building these, these, uh, you know, the, the, the capability to supervise the population and like centrally control everything that everybody's doing. So that's that's a uh, that's a calculus that I don't know how strong it is. You know, whether they want to continue living the rich life, you know, the the upper class, or not. Well, here's the other part that you got to think about. Go go to maps. Go to maps. Just just go to uh, uh, not that map. Just go to regular. Put Taiwan. And then just go, yeah, Taiwan and map, okay? 
So here's a couple things you got to think about. But go to the map on Google Map, not the images. Just click on Map right. No, no, just right there below it. Just go to Maps right there. There you go. So if you go to Map and go to Taiwan, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, go a little closer, okay. So so to the left, go a little bit out, a little bit out, a little bit out. There you go. To the left is Hong Kong, okay. Now you got to realize Hong Kong for 156 years was part of a British, uh, uh, you know, Br the Brits had Hong Kong, right? And in, two, in 19, what is it, 1997, late 90s, they get it back, okay? All right, so say Hong Kong asks for help. Who do they call? Say Taiwan asks for help. Guys, help us. Now, zoom out a little bit. Zoom out a little bit. Okay, we're on our way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're on our way, guys. We'll be there in a minute. Uh, we'll be there in six hours. Oh, Japan, we're going to get involved and help you. Oh, uh, we're going to get involved and help you. And then, uh, no, it's done, right? Now go to Ukraine. Now go to Ukraine. So just go to the other side. Just move the map. No, no, you don't need to put the name there. Just move the map, yeah. So keep going left, keep going left, keep going left, keep going left. Okay, now look at Ukraine. Go down a little bit to see Russia and Ukraine. Hey, guys, I need help. Boom, we're there. NATO. Yeah, NATO. UK. So, so the Taiwan is going to be a, a, a lot different than a Ukraine's uh, uh, going to be. It, it, it was not uh, that they're not going to have a hard time doing that. But I do agree with the fact that this. Now, here's the other question. What are the chances? What are the chances that there was a conversation between Xi and Putin where Putin and Xi talked about, hey, uh, uh, you're calling us the most important strategic partner, the foreign minister. Russia is our most important, <clears throat> you know, strategic partner, right? That's the word. Now, what are the chances of Xi and Putin having a conversation together saying, look, you know, no cameras, no nothing, no one's around, nobody knows this conversation. I know what you want. They talk in code, and you know what I want. Do you think this is a good time for me to go do it? Do you think there's any kind of a proxy type of thing where she is like, I think this is a perfect time to do it? Like you giving him cover. No, you know what? It's kind of like, Adam, I think you can be tighter. I think this is the time. So you should swing. I've been if thinking I about that swing. all day, Pat. All day. <laughs> yeah, but Tyler, do, you don't stand a chance. Do you got subway? So I, got my, I got my pin here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you think somebody poked him to do it? Or no? Do you think Putin it's, didn't need anybody to poke him? Like she didn't try to create a proxy war? It's a good guess. It's a good guess that they had like face to face conversation and uh, off the record, so to speak. You know, hint hint. Yeah, but do you think do you think there is any chance that she would say, uh, "I would if I were you right now"? You know, I, I I think it's a good time right now to do it. Do you think that kind of a conversation would take place or no? Plausible deniability would uh, indicate that uh, you don't say it directly and openly. You just hint. Got it. I agree. Like you you you. Do you, do you do it directly or do you use a third party to go deliver that message to his camp? Right. Are you suggesting that Putin oh. would want to get Xi's, you know, green light to, in order to invade Ukraine? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I wonder, like, I wonder what is the level of unity between the two guys? Because bring the map out, bring the map out, bring the map out. Look at China, look at Russia. They Where touch are they? each other. They're, they're right there. All right. On the eastern side of the country, they touch you. They are not just buddy separated buddies. by Kazakhstan. This is a marriage of convenience. Uh, ideologically, they, they are different. Uh, uh, Putin is also looking to retain influence in the former republics that have Asians living in them and that, uh, that border on China. Uh, I guarantee you that there's conflicts. Okay. And there has been a That's good, history though. of shooting at each other at the border, no major conflict, but they, they're, they're not best buddies. But, uh, you know, when it comes to their main enemy, they are somewhat united against the United States. That's very good news that they are not buddy-buddy, if, if it's true. Yeah. If it's true. They're almost more... They're, they're, it's an alliance. They're not natural partners. I mean, they're almost... Like, we covered this yesterday. Russia's still selling weapons to... India, for India to prepare against the fight against China. I mean, they're not partners. Xi, Xi has has bigger goals than just being friends with Vladimir Putin. I mean, it's it's why I think the best thing we can do is really, which Joe Biden has done to his credit, is stay out of Ukraine and out of this conflict and not push Vladimir Putin into the arms of Xi Jinping. Because the big question becomes, what happens when China invades Taiwan? What do we do? Do we put boots on the ground? Is that when we step in? I mean, I, I think it's inevitable. So what happens when that 
becomes a reality. Or is is World War Three inevitable? I mean, what, uh, <clears throat> Taiwan makes sixty percent of the semi semiconductors in the world. Right. You think you have a chip shortage now? Just wait. You know, uh, Taiwan when when it, when when it gets invaded. I don't think it's an if. I think it's a when. Is going to be very different than what's going on in Ukraine. And and the answer or the question is, what does Joe Biden do? Why would the U.S. even attempt to step into a Taiwanese takeover? That's not even anything that we would even want to meddle in. He, you just heard him say the 60% chips, though. There's yeah, but be... that's, you know, there's alternative measures that we can take other than trying to get into a hot war with China. You know, they have the triad that we discussed yesterday, mm -hmm. Australia, Japan, um, United States. And what's the fourth country? Uh, what did you say? Australia, Japan, United States. Mm -hmm. And it's not India, is it? UK, you tell me the triad is, is uh... and there's a fourth country involved in the triad. But point is, there, there's an alliance created to combat Ch China's influence in the uh, South China Sea. It might be India, um, but yeah, I, I don't think U.S. is looking for a hot war at all. Do you think it's just sanctions, like what we're doing with <clears throat> Russia I mean, now? Th there's got to be alternative measures here. Uh, war is not the answer here right now. And and back to the gas prices. I had a conversation with my mom yesterday, and my mom is zero percent knowledge about what's going on. So I posed the question. I go, Mom, how much does it cost to fill your tank? She says it costs forty bucks. I said, Well, you do understand now that gas prices are rising. She goes, Yeah, I know. It cost me fifty dollars <clears throat> this week to fill my tank. So how often do you fill your tank? Once a week. So I said, it's going to cost you $10 more, you know, in general to fill your tank. She goes, okay. Like, to combat tyranny and to stand up against autocratic thinking like Putin, if it costs my mom, who's a nurse, $10 more a week, so be it. You know, gas prices aren't the end-all, be-all. Yes, there are bigger things like the trucker that you talked about and businesses or people who drive for a living. You know, maybe you eat out a little bit less, but you're going to have to do something different. But for my mom to spend ten dollars more a week, so be it. So 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 I will I will uh, uh, take a different position with that. And uh, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you this. So right now, the, the crisis is so bad on the left that they have to figure out a way to either take a few different measures to not make the gas price a massive issue. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're facing a few different problems. Why are we having so many uh, uh, problems world? We didn't have a war during Trump. Why are we having so many problems under this administration? Why is that? First, we have the Afghanistan. Now we have this. First, we have inflation. Gas prices go up. Now we have this. Why is this happening? Well, we just what? had a worldwide pandemic. So, I mean, a lot of this is systemic because of that. R right. But again, so even with the pandemic, throw that in there as well. Why? why so the, the, the left has to position everything to be normal. It's okay. It's gas prices just going up. It's okay. You know, it's inflation. It's, it's going to be okay. It's going to go away. No, it's not really inflation. It's because of this. Oh, it's really going on because they have to deflect, deflect, deflect because midterms. Mm -hmm. There's an element of it that's politics. But the part of it that... With your mom's story, I'm glad it doesn't affect her, the 10 bucks. I'm fully glad it doesn't affect her. It affects a lot of people. My, believe me, my mom is of the elk that it would affect the common I, person. I, I get that. She's but, in by no way means doing but well. But your mom is also not in the working environment where she has kids to take care of, where she has expenses to cover, where she has to drop off the kids, drive them to soccer, uh -huh. do all that <laughs> other stuff. She's a retired woman that is not necessarily have 50 different things to do when you were 12 years old and when you were 8 years old. It's a different life for somebody that's going through that, trying to survive on a time like that. But the price increase is going to be felt, and it's not just going to be gas. Gas is only one thing we're talking about. Just watch all the other prices. And FYI, if you think the gas prices are at the peak right now, people are lying to themselves or they're naive. Wait till this thing gets to ten dollars, and everybody has to have the real conversations about. Listen, I, I was kind of okay at four dollars, but I, I'm not okay with ten dollars. But don't you think at that point a Biden administration will start opening up the floodgates of oil? What's the difference between starting now and then? What is the difference between I, I now and then? I wouldn't be shocked if they started now. Well, if well I, yesterday they announced <laughs> that they're going to ban 
Russian oil. Okay, so where do we think we're going to get oil but, from? But, but, okay, so we're going to have, and that's why we're. No, no, the no. The negotiations are happening right yeah, now. Yeah, there you go. So if you rush, uh, ban with Russia, that's a very good strategy for PR. That's great to say we're not doing it with PR. Great, like McDonald's. We're, we're shutting down 700 stores in Russia. Okay? Starbucks. Okay, this down, is good. Yeah. You have to do that because your customers are going to be like, what do you like? You know, these restaurants, liquor stores are coming out and pouring all their vodka, you know, and, and then. Somebody came oh, back really? and said the following. They said, oh, really? You're pouring all this stuff out of vodka? Why don't you go throw all this stuff out that you have in your store that says made in China? <laughs> if you're really that committed. Right. Why, why don't you go out and drop all the made in China yeah, stuff? How come nobody's saying that? Oh, you're only saying because this is cool to do that, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even think about doing it if you were supposed to drop all this stuff in made in China because you do so much money. So there's so much hypocrisy in this thing right now that you just, you just have to kind of really see... Uh, what's going on? But uh, but this this gas prices, if it hits 10 and Biden's still trying to negotiate his camp with Maduro's camp, mm -hmm. Venezuela or Saudi Arabia, or they're already in talks or Iran or all these other guys, we look so weak. You're negotiating with the enemy. Hey, can you please sell us some gas at a discount? Please. Things are pretty bad in America. Why don't you go get it yourself? And, and then they ask the. Maybe we will, though, right? The maybe is if they do, we will salute them on the podcast and say, "Awesome decision for you doing that." Well, if you were if you were Tony Blinken or in a you know, national security advisor working for the Biden administration, <clears throat> you just hypothetically, what would, what would you recommend he does differently, or what do you what advice would you what counsel would I don't you have give access Biden? to all the intel? If I had access to all yeah, the intel, based that, on you know, if I had you know, access to all the intel and I got people around me from both sides giving me feedback on why to or why not to. Then I would ask and say, "What? so we got 100 years of reserve. Yes. Okay. How long do you think this crisis is going to last? Say 90 days. Okay. 100 years, 90 days means we got 400 more years of reserves. Why don't we go ahead and get 90 days worth of supply right now, lower the gas prices by 25, 35, 40 percent. And then 90 days later, we can go back and see what we can strike up a deal with somebody else. Okay. Maybe you can put a timeline on it that we're going to uh, fix it for now. Mm -hmm. But here's the other part that I'll, I'll flip it on you is. There's got to be a long-term solution, okay? There, there has to be a long-term solution. These are all nice band-aids you're putting on there. Okay, no, 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 reactionary. Oh, reactionary. Oh, reactionary. But what's the long-term solution? The long-term solution is the one I'm, I'm really interested in because it's both ways. To go green? You know, the EV part? Nuclear. You know, whether it's the nuclear, the fossil, the solar. Else, solar. Wind. They, there's got to be... There's like, for example, California, yesterday Newsom posted something on Twitter. I'm like, oh, my God, here he goes again. He posted something on uh, uh, on Twitter yesterday bragging about how great California is doing. I don't know if you saw that or not. <laughs> he said, California raised the minimum wage. We increased paid sick leave, provided more paid family leave, expanded child care. You know, uh, 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 and this year will be the first state to provide health care for all, regardless of immigration status. That's the California way. Did you see what I said to him? And then I, I said, I wouldn't brag about it. Your policies caused California's population yeah. to drop by 182,000 last year, making it the first yearly loss since its founding in 1850s. Bad policies have consequences, right? Bad policies have consequences. The, the political system that we have today, mm -hmm. the voting system, Adam, it's so uh, uh, reactionary that everybody is more concerned about being reelected that you're not yeah. making good long-term policies. But you don't. I mean, you lived in California, so you have obviously strong opinions on this. I don't feel bad for Californians. Why? They chose this. No, no question about it. They, but they, they, they had the opportunity to <laughs> cut off Newsom, and they overwhelmingly, by two thirds, I, I guarantee voted you, to keep him. I guarantee you in the comment section right now, 40% are saying you don't, you, that they don't speak on my behalf. Well, and let's not forget what California <laughs> yeah. did. They perma uh, permanently enrolled or uh, instilled mail-in balloting. They're allowing illegal immigrants to vote. They have a huge population of sanctuary cities. It's like the 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 yeah that's still not gonna California. that's still not gonna change the vote whatsoever. Well, I mean, there's California there could is, be some is the most liberal in that. state in the country, arguably. So, sanctuary cities they're cute and all, but they're not swaying millions and millions and millions of voters. Well, again, there could be some discrepancies in the actual voting process. If it was a you know fifty five forty five vote, all right, maybe seventy thirty, not so much. <laughs> I'll go back to the fact that we are we're dealing with a, a population that isn't educated well enough to understand. You know, if I vote for this, 
somebody has to pay for that. And how, where, where did, how does it all balance out? And, you know, the, the stuff that Newsom just bragged about, somebody has to pay for that. So your taxes mm -hmm. will go up again, right? And, uh, you know, I was recently in, in L.A. What a dump. <laughs> What a dump. LAX is uh, worse. It's sad to say that. That was a beautiful city, man. Uh, there's homeless camps all over the place, and the city is drab. There's just nothing that looks inviting anymore, yet there's still people living there. But but my friends who have some means, they all live someplace outside of the city. It's, it's, it's a shame, and I, I've been given to understand that San Francisco looks pretty much the same these days. And San Francisco is worse than LA. The prettiest city that ever was in the United States. San Francisco. Yeah. Now it's a hot mess. So, so why don't they connect the dots? Did it just happen just sporadically, and there's nobody to be held accountable for? Where do you live? I live in uh, outside of Atlanta. In Atlanta, yeah, okay. pretty good. Atlanta, yeah. Bad okay. traffic though. Yeah. Look at that. Look, look <laughs> at that real quick. Look at that real quick. What's that? That's L.A. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh god, that is L.A. That's insane to think that's L.A. See, I don't remember it looking like that. I lived there twenty plus years. I don't remember looking at it like that. That's what, what they're doing is they're rating the trains. When the trains come in from Amazon, FedEx, the packages they. Gangs of people mm -hmm. go up, rip the trains open, steal all the packages, steal all the goods, and take off. Yeah, I mean, that definitely inspires people to say, I'm going to wake up and move to California tomorrow. I'm definitely on my way to go to mm -hmm. California tomorrow. <clears throat> I just wonder how long this is going to go. Because nothing lasts forever. You have to know. Not, winning doesn't last forever. You're eventually going to lose. You know, yeah. you're, the Bulls, you know, dynasty, six years, boom. Lakers, Kobe, Shaq, boom. You got... You know, whatever the, the you, so Spurs, nothing. Boom. It doesn't Heat, last boom. forever. I just wonder what's going to happen to California, where some of them are going to wake up and say, "You know what? I'm done with this." Final thoughts here before we wrap up. We got ten minutes here, uh, Jack. Um, <clears throat> Putin, okay, with where he's at and what he's up to. Um, what 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 level of optimism do you have that all of this is going to get worked out? Uh, versus uh, it all of a sudden getting even worse and us in the U.S. being affected by this? <clears throat> I think I'm, I'm more on the optimistic side. Okay. Um, assuming that Putin isn't really going crazy. I mean, really crazy, crazy. Uh, because if he has in the past shown uh, a realism that helped him stay in power and remain a player to be reckoned with he cannot if if he if he goes too far and and then we escalate then then the, the worst thing might happen but um i i think this one will be resolved not very quickly but it it will be resolved if you could speculate what do you think are Putin's deepest, deepest, deepest desires. To be recognized uh, as the modern day Messiah. Come for the, for on. The oh, Russian you think it's for that, the Russian people? Like that? Yes. And what does that mean? Like, how does that play out? The Messiah? Well, he, he's rebuilding the Russian Empire. He's, Is he, though? Well, well, he, because he's attacking he, he's Ukraine? about He's about to. That, but that's his goal. So what's the next step Clint. after after Ukraine? Because this is obviously an unmitigated disaster from a PR standpoint and possibly <clears throat> from a political standpoint. What's the next move? Because this is a seems like a failed move attempt. You know? uh, Moldova is a sitting duck, and uh, he ha for Mo Moldova he has also a good reason to attack because there is already in um, a part of Moldova which is not governed by Mo Moldavians. The Russians live there as an exclave. I forgot what it's called, and they could be asking for help. That's that's a that's Moldova is weak. Uh, I don't believe he he will go to the Baltic states. So, what's his intention to make USSR great again? I mean, is that ultimately yeah. what he's looking to do? He the wants to the put Russian together? Empire. I don't think he wants to rule the world. The Russian Empire. And 
in the course of his lifetime he's looking to do this? He's 70 years old. Let's say he lives to 90. You're saying he wants to accomplish this in the next two decades? You know, as uh, Patrick said, you know, you know, we all believe we're not going to die, right? So he, he still looks at the future. So do I. <laughs> You're not planning for your death unless you're deathly ill, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's got plans. But ultimately he wants to rebuild the grid. And, and, and what's the time frame that he wants to bring it back to when Russia was this great superpower? Well, hopefully within his lifetime. No, meaning what, what does he look at and say, the 1960s, that's where we were at our peak. What, what was peak Russian empire in his mind? <clears throat> Oh, it was the Soviet Union, for sure. There were two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, equal particularly because of the, the nuclear uh, tie. You know. Mm -hmm. So, And he wants some of this back, but primarily he's, he's, a, he's a Russian more than he, he's not a communist anymore. When he says the, the fall of the Soviet Union, when he said that was... Uh, the greatest uh, tragedy of the 20th century, he really, really, deep down inside, you know, he meant, you know, that, that Russia wasn't strong anymore. Because you look, when you look at the map, the, <clears throat> uh, the, the states, the, the republics of the Soviet Union that are surrounding Russia now, um, they provided half, at least half the strength of, of the Russian economy. The Russian economy now, right now is what number eleven in the world. Mm -hmm. GDP uh, wise, right. Right. So there isn't much Less there. Less than two trillion dollars. Uh, what was it, Pat? A little over two. So he wants to build this back up in some way. I, and, and I he can't, wants I, to do it by force, by taking over NATO countries or Eastern Bloc countries. In a in a clever way, and he, I, I believe he thinks that he's been really clever on Ukraine because you know he's got Russians everywhere in other countries, living in other countries who could be asking for help. You know, look, there's two <laughs> things. So go go to two places. Say he succeeds with Ukraine. There's 13 other nations that are shivering. <laughs> okay, if <clears throat> he succeeds with Ukraine. If he succeeds with Ukraine. Define success. Meaning Ukraine gives up and they say, hey, you know, we're going to be more Russian than we're going to be part of, you know, whatever may happen there. Right? You, you, Ukraine, NATO, EU. If he succeeds. If the the Ukrainian ones, people will not give up. I, I agree with That's you. why I say define success. Oh, I agree with you. I don't, I'm just saying if he does, mm -hmm. if he does succeed there, this, the if is a very big if. It's not a small if. It's a big, big if if he does. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't succeed, what does he do? Does he re-strategize to attack again five years from now, ten years from now? Or is he just going to sit there and say, guys, I'm done with that. Let's no. just try to be friendly with the world again. No, and let's no. not make Russia great, you know. He's not, he's not going to give up. Okay. He's, he's, he's on a one-way street. You can't turn around. He can't. That would so, sort of deny everything that he has become and that he was and, and the belief that he has in his own strength wouldn't. Who do you think is his hero and who do you think is his foil? Like, meaning he probably looks at Boris Yeltsin and Mikhail Gorbachev as weak. Does he look Absolutely. at Stalin as the great patriarch or Lenin? Who, who, who would you put in the, you know, the hero column and in the, the zero column? I, I'm not aware of any direct statements of him, you know, making a hero of, of some of his predecessors. He has said some critical things about Lenin. I forgot. I read something. I forgot exactly what it was. So, um, Peter the Great, pre USSR times, no. as an individual, imperial, uh, no. Russia, no. Peter the Great put Russia on the map as far as Europe was concerned. B before him, mm -hmm. it was a real backward country with uh, ninety-five percent of the population farming the land. Every once in a while, you drop a really good question. <laughs> it leads to a very good conversation. Peter the Great. However, we are coming to the end yes. of the podcast. Jack, appreciate you for coming out. Well, this was a blast. Me. Thank you, Mr. Really Barsky. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, I believe we're back at it again tomorrow with Liz Wheeler. Go ahead. May I put a plug in? Absolutely, for please. My podcast. Yes, <clears throat> uh, for uh, sure. Imperative Productions produced an a, a audio drama based on my life. 
It's available on all streaming uh, platforms, uh, audio platforms, uh, Spotify, Apple, and so forth. It's really well made. It's professionally made. And what what it makes called? Uh, it's called the agent. What makes this better than the book that I wrote is because there's besides me there's many other voices. Uh, so you, uh, it gives the story mm -hmm. a, a, an added dimension, stuff that I couldn't mention in the book because it's, it's my voice. And there's narration as well, so it, it puts me into the context of history of the Is Cold that War. The one? That's the one. I'm going to put the link below for people to see oh, it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to put the link below. I uh, found the link. I don't know if you did find the link. Um, we got the link in the chat, and we'll put it down below as well for people. Fantastic. Thank you Fantastic. Very much. Folks, go check it out. Jack, thank Better, you so buddy. much for coming on. Tomorrow we'll have Liz Wheeler, and there's going to be a surprise guest. There's a guest that we'll have on Friday morning that we probably won't go live with, but we're going to put that mm -hmm. only on Spotify for people to find. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher. But go, we'll not, we'll you make won't find rounds. that on YouTube. That's not only on YouTube. Do. Uh, yeah, they'll find out why. That's the only way we could do that one. And then the other one on Friday afternoon, you're not going to want to miss it. That's all I can tell you. I can't give you a name. Two podcasts on Friday. Two morning, morning afternoon. Well, but not on YouTube. Only one of them right. will be on YouTube. The other one's going to be on Spotify. Got it. Having said that, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye.